Hi, I'm Sean Michael Reagan, and in today's video, Cool Tools talks steel rules. Here's a generic desk ruler. The smallest division on one of these is usually one millimeter if you're talking metric, or one sixteenth of an inch if you're talking US units. If you just need to trace along a straight edge or take a rough measurement, this thing works fine. If you're building something, however, especially something small with lots of parts, you're probably going to need to be more precise. That's where the steel rule comes in. On this particular model, which is US units only, the smallest division is 1 64th of an inch, which is four times better than your everyday ruler. Some steel rules even have divisions as small as 1 100th of an inch, which is about the thickness of two pieces of paper back to back. When you're trying to distinguish lines that close together, details of your rules manufacture, like its finish, rigidity, and even its graphic design can start to matter a lot. So we're going to be putting these tools literally under a microscope to figure out which one delivers the best value and why. As always, you'll find links to purchase each of these items in the description field down below the video. If you do decide to pick any of them up, please consider using those links to support this channel and the Cool Tools blog. Okay, here are three 6-inch steel rules from three different manufacturers. You can get these longer or shorter if you need to, but 6 inches is the most common size and kind of a toolbox standard. On the bargain end is General Tools Model 676, which is made of relatively low-grade stainless steel and manufactured in India, but will get the job done. Amazon wants 7 bucks for one of these. In the middle price range, there's this Model 402-006 from Products Engineering Corporation of Torrance, California, also known as PEC. It's made of a higher quality stainless that's been tempered and given a brushed finish. That's twice as much as the generic import tool, 14 bucks if you buy from Amazon. And on the deluxe end, we have this model C604RE-6 by the LS Starrett Company. Starrett, if you don't already know, is kind of legendary among tool enthusiasts, especially in the United States. It's a 130-year-old Massachusetts-based company that has an absolutely outstanding reputation for making top-of-the-line tools, which are, you know, priced accordingly. This little ruler is one of the least expensive Starrett tools you can buy at $27. It's made of premium grade, spring-tempered carbon steel, not stainless, and has been given a special finish called satin chrome, which is kind of a Starrett hallmark. Now, all three of these are so-called rigid rules, meaning they're stiff. With a rigid rule, this is actually considered better measuring technique than this, because in this position, the parallax, the fact that the lines converge to a distant point that changes depending on where you put your eye, makes it harder to get an accurate reading. In this position, there's no parallax effect, or at least much less of one. This position also shows off a secondary use for a good steel rule, which is to test a surface for flatness. Now, you can also get flexible steel rules, and I have some of those here. Starrett actually makes two different grades of flexible rules. One they call semi-flexible, which is this one, and another they call full flexible, like this one. But even with a full flexible rule, you can only bend the thing about yay far around without feeling like you're gonna damage it. And how often are you really gonna need to measure 6 inches or less down to the 64th around a curve no sharper than the radius of a dinner plate? Add to that the fact that, with a flexible rule, you can't measure like this anymore without the risk that your rule is actually bent a little bit to one side or the other, and that your measurement is going to be too long as a consequence. So, I say, Stick to rigid rules unless you need a flexible one for some specialized purpose. Now, obviously the most important concern with a measuring tool is that it's accurate. But that's something we can pretty much take for granted here. Modern manufacturing tolerances are just so much finer than these distances that you can basically bet the farm that any one of these rules is going to be just as accurate as any other. At least to any reasonable standard. So, Taking accuracy as given, the second most important factor, I'd argue, is readability. And here you do start to see significant differences between these tools, with Starrett pretty clearly leading the pack. I'm going to use the microscope here to show you why I think that is. Okay, here I've got PEC up top and Starrett underneath. First thing to notice is the color difference. The brushed stainless finish on the PEC is darker, more like a gray. The Starrett finish, which is actually plated chrome, is much closer to white which gives better contrast against the black markings and makes the scale easier to read. The second thing to see here is the quality of the finish. The PEC rule has polishing scratches, which are noticeable at this scale, and those pick up a lot of visual noise from the various light sources around the room. 
The starret finish is much finer. At this scale, it still looks pretty much flat and smooth. The third factor to notice is the width of the lines. On the starret, they're wider, i.e. they're bolder, which makes them easier to see. I also think it helps that the lines and the spaces between the lines are nearly the same width, so you get this even visual rhythm. Light, dark, light, dark, etc. as your eye moves along the edge. A fourth factor I'd point out is the relative lengths of the lines. Once you've identified a mark along the edge for your measurement, your eye has to kind of pull back from the edge and figure out if that line means 45 60 fourths or 23 30 seconds or whatever. On the PEC, your eye's got to move all this way before it gets any information about what that line actually means. And when it does get here, there's this relatively small difference between the length of this line and the length of this line that lets you say, oh, that's a 64th of an inch. On the starret, your eye only moves this far back from the edge, and then it's got this big noticeable jump that makes it easy to tell what you're looking at. Fifth and finally, there's the numerals themselves, the typography they use, and how they're laid out. The print on the PEC is smaller, which obviously makes it harder to read. It's also bolder, which you'd think might help, but in practice I'm not sure really does. Boldness counts, but so does the negative space around a symbol. And when you make a small font too bold, you really compress details like, say, the insides of the circles on the 8s. I mean, look how much more white space you've got inside that 8 than you do inside that one. That makes it a lot easier to see, oh, that's an 8 rather than a 9. I think Starrett's use of a serifed font helps here as well. When the numerals have serifs, your eye has more information it can use to tell a 1 from a 7, or a 4 from a 9, or whatever. In terms of layout, I find PEC's choice to make the numbers alternate up and down like this needlessly confusing, because, you know, these numbers are all counting in one unit, which in this case is 60 fourths of an inch. This is 48 60 fourths. This is 56 60 fourths, etc. So why should they jump up and down like that? Star it gets it right. What we're doing here is counting 60 fourths of an inch along a number line, so the numbers themselves should be in a line. In this view, the PEC is still up top, but I've replaced the star it underneath with General Tools Model 676. Now, they're obviously very similar. Where we can see differences, it's kind of a mixed bag. The finish on the general tools rule is a bit rougher, but then it also has slightly wider lines marking the divisions. The numbers on the PEC are a bit bolder, and a bit darker, but they're also a bit less sharp. Now, we're really splitting hairs here, but to my eye, which numbers are easier to read varies depending on how far back I'm looking from. From a distance, the numbers on the PEC are easier for me to read, but from close in it swaps, and the general tools print becomes more legible. PEC does offer a couple of interesting finishes that you can't get anywhere else. This one, which sells for $13, is called Black Chrome, and this one is Titanium Nitride, which gives a really beautiful gold color and sells for $25. This is an awesome tool, don't get me wrong, but it does suffer from most of the same readability issues I pointed out on this one, and at $25, I feel like you might as well spend another two bucks and get a star in. I was really excited about the black chrome model, because inverting the color scheme seemed like it could be a game changer in terms of readability, and at $13 this tool seemed like it could have been a nice compromise between poor quality and exorbitant expense. When I got my hands on this one, however, I was pretty disappointed. What they don't show you in the marketing photos is that this black background is actually glossy, and when you put enough light on it to see what you're doing, the reflections are distracting to the point of frustration. It also shows fingerprints better than just about any surface I've ever seen. So, bottom line, my recommendation first is to buy Star if you can afford it. If you can't justify spending $27 on a 6 inch ruler, I say skip the PEC products and take the cheap import model. Okay, thanks for watching. Again, you'll find links to purchase each of these products down below, and as always, you can read about thousands more reader recommended tools over at cool-tools.org. We'll see you next time.